Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, EM algorithm. So it's uh, based on uh, a Gaussian distribution mixture model. Next two sessions we might talk about pack learning and bias variance, and then we might wrap up uh, with some theoretical points um, either on December first or yeah, I guess your December first would be the last session. Yeah, perhaps in three or four lectures. Yeah. All right. Any questions before I start? All good. Uh, will you post like a similar um, like preparation um, questions like in the term for the final? Mm, yeah, sure. Also, I, I I post an announcement for your final exam. The 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 room yet to be decided. So if I got to know that, I'll update that announcement so you can just check back that assignment. Um, okay, I, I I pinned it to the assignment uh, announcement so we can access it faster. All right, so previous lecture, we talked about um, k-mean clustering, right? We started unsupervised learning, and we talked about those two sub-problems of sort of an egg and chicken problem that how are we going to construct um, those, uh, those s's from s1 up to sk, which was the number of cluster, right? Uh, and then how are we going to update those clusters and, and find the, the centroid of those clusters? And then we can repeat that uh, iteratively to, to come up and converge to, uh, you know, the best clusters found given the data that we had, right? So the properties of k-mean we talked about was it wasn't a global um, globally optimal algorithm. It was locally optimal. Uh, we needed to input the, the algorithm with k as the number of clusters. And we mentioned that there are other techniques <coughs> that we don't talk about it in this course, but in general, for instance, hierarchical uh, clustering or agglomerative clustering and so many other sub-branches of those techniques do not need an input K, right? So the other um, very famous and popular clustering method that is, you know, working based on distribution, right? Density distribution is called EM algorithm or expectation maxim maximization algorithm. So there are two versions with that. Hard, which uh, states that the clusters do not overlap, and soft decision, which allows the clusters to overlap while clustering. So we're going to talk about that today. There are a lot of uh, ground to be covered. Uh, so I tried to come, you know, sort of make a compact. Uh, lecture of all those information for density estimation and Gaussian mixture model. Um, so, so many things I had to skip those to fit it into our schedule. All right, so let's just start with a, a quick definition of a density estimation. So, what exactly is a density estimation technique? So, we are interested to construct an estimate, right, based on some observed data that we have, right, the data that we have and of unobserved unknown density function. So the output that is unknown and we want to <coughs> construct it is a density function of the, of the data that we have, OK? So we have some data. We want to we wanna understand what density uh, function those data are representing. So data in this scope is considered as a random sample of the distribution, right? And the unknown density function can be thought of as the density, right, according to which a large population is distributed. So based on the data, we are trying to infer a density distribution or, or an unknown density function uh, that the data is according to that, OK? So say this is your data, right, all the histogram of your data in blue and that line, that red line, right, corresponding with the density, is inferring the density function that we are trying to understand. So, and this is the data. Okay. So the application is obvious. We don't have the labels for the, of the data. We just want to gain some information about their characteristics, right? Um, sort of gaining in, gaining insights insights from properties of given data. Also, I mentioned uh, in a previous lecture that it's very useful to have <coughs> density estimation and unsupervised learning in general for 
uh, anomaly detection and novelty or anomaly or novelty both ex extreme ends of the same technique right for instance if by constructing this unknown density function right we can understand that if an observation lies in a very low density for instance if an observation was lying here here or here we can treat them as anomaly right or novelty depending on the domain we are talking about right computer vi uh, virus scanners might treat it this way email spammers can treat uh, can sort of gain some insight from these methods and a combination of other methods as well. So by this uh, density estimation, we can understand uh, anomaly or novelty, right, in general. So that, that's, the, that's the very high level definition of that. All right, so, in order to understand the definition of distributions and specifically Gaussian or normal distribution, I thought I'll have a quick recap of those two distributions. For sure, you have been uh, thought of those type of distribution in our statistic course. Is that correct? Did you have a statistic before this? Okay, almost. All right, so <clears throat> let's talk about the the one-dimensional or univariate Gaussian distribution, okay? So, a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution is defined by some hyperparameters, right? So, we, call, we can define it by sort of this N shape to represent normal distribution. And the hyperparameters of that are their median, I'm sorry, their, their, their mean, which is the mu, and their sigma square, okay? which is the variance. So here we have four different distributions, four different Gaussian distributions, and these are our x's, right? The data we have. And you see for those three that the, that the mean is equal to zero, right? Their maximum point, their center point, is exactly located at the mean and at zero point, because mu, uh, mu was zero. For this case, for the case of the, the green distribution, you're gonna see that mu was minus 2 and that represents the maximum amount <clears throat> here at, at the point minus 2. And the, the, the variance hyperparameter is actually telling us what was the, the, the distance between these two points. Okay, So normally starting from the center point which was the median and the other right or left side of the distribution you're going to have one variance one sigma and the other side would be another sigma right so the overall distance here would be treated as two sigmas this space we're going to talk about those uh, specific intervals in statistics in statistics in the next slide but for now you need to know that we can define a Gaussian or normal distribution in 1D by that n form shape function of x, given that those x are having two hyperparameters, mean and a standard deviation, right? And easily we can, by having the standard deviation, we can have the variance, right? Because it's, it's the square uh, version of the standard deviation, okay? So, the probability of this value is going to be considered as 1 over a normalizing constant to pi sigma 2, right, root square, and then quadratic form of exp min a negative exponential, right? All, all of the x's minus their mu square and divided by two uh, sigma square, right? So this gives you a scalar value of their uh, 
probability distribution, okay? So, should be e. So now, if we are trying to estimate uh, certain sampling from this distribution, right? And that's why we have an estimate value with this hat here. So it's, instead of mu, we're going to have mu hat and sigma hat, okay? Say you had a thousand data points in your distribution and you want to estimate the, the, the likelihood, maximum likelihood estimate of with 10 points, right? 15 points. So for those estimate, simply in order to find their mean, you just have to divide their values by their number, right? It's a summation of uh, summation over all of those j's, and we have n of those j's, right? So xj's divided by their number. Just like that, for <clears throat> having an estimate for the, the variance, you're going to have to just deduct all of their po points from their mean and square that value divided by the number of n. So this is an estimate of some sampling that we, get with, that we get out of a normal or Gaussian distribution with that specific mu and sigma. Is that clear so far? And another point is the reason we do a normalizing constant is the fact that the uh, the summation of the area underneath the p right should be equal to one. So px x right should be equal to one, and that's why by this normalizing constant we want to make sure that the the value is going to become one. We're going to see more of that later. All right, I mentioned quickly about the, the width and narrowness of the, the shape of the distribution here, and that we can estimate it using mu minus or plus sigma, right, on either way. Because of that, there are uh, there has been definitions of confidence intervals that I just I can bring it up. Uh, you might have heard about student t-test or other type of testing for confidence interval, and that they are representing the some portion of a normal distribution using their mean and variance uh, and, and, and standard deviation. So. 68% confidence interval represents an area that you can define from mu and mu plus standard deviation plus, uh, plus sigma and minus sigma, right? So this, in a normal distribution, this area represents 68% of the population, okay? Double of that plus two sigmas, minus two sigmas, it's going to represent 95% of the distribution, 68, 95, and plus 3 is almost representing 99.7. It's almost 100% of the distribution. So, and this is their, their probability using that formula. If you, if you compute it in a normal distribution, you're going to have a number almost around 68%, 95%, and 99%. So we use this to remember the percentage values of the data that lies within a band around that mean and, uh, you know, around the mean of the normal distribution. So if you recall in, in some statistical tests, such as a student t-test, we use this uh, normality test to, uh, to test that if a sample is coming from a normal distribution or if two samples are close to each other or not using the, uh, the null hypothesis and p-values and, and the rest of the story which is a little bit outside the, the, the scope of our course. 
But the point is, having a normal distribution as a reference will give you some guidelines and information on how to perceive some data inside that distribution. Okay, so that that's the that's the overall goal. All right, so we discussed about one-dimensional uh, univariate Gaussian distribution, right? What if we want to define it in higher dimension, right, as a multivariate Gaussian distribution? So our curvature will go into a 3D object, a bell-shaped object, or sometimes we call it bump, a uh, bump function that still we can define it with uh, some similar hyperparameters. But since we are dealing with multiple variances, multiple variances simply can be defined by covariance matrix, right? So instead of <coughs> variance here, we're going to have covariance. So this is a covariance. We can define that by n, those x's given mu j and covariance of j. All right, so the, the probability of i and x, given that normal distribution, can be computed as, again, some other form of normalizing constant. So this d divided by 2 is, is actually a root square, so treat it as this. And then e to the raise of negative exponential, I, each of those x's minus their mu transpose, so it's in vector space, the covariance matrix uh, minus 1, inverted, and then x minus mu i, okay, divided by 2. So you see that simply the first one, the first multiplication is a row vector, right? The second one, which is an in, in inverted uh, matrix, is, was d by d, right? That was the size. And the third one is a column vector. So can anyone tell me if you multiply a row vector with a square metro, uh, vector, a square matrix and a column vector, what would be the output dimension-wise? Right, a row, square, and a and a column. Scalar. Yeah, and that's why we have one scalar output, right? Which is the probability of that pi. So this is a scalar value, one point, one, uh, one value. All right, just like the, the one-dimensional uh, <coughs> Gaussian distribution, we can have the estimates for the means mu i, so these are the vectors, up to mu k, and covariance summation y up to k. So for that matter, in, for mean, we're going to use the expected value instead, right? The expected value of x now is going to be defined as their mean. And that's the, the estimate of the, the mean in a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And the covariance, which is a variance between uh, two uh, matrices, right? The covariance is going to be defined as x minus uh, their mu multiply their uh, x minus mu again transpose, right? This is going to be the covariance. So this is the estimate for the covariance. So the, the superiority of having GMMs rather than other density estimations um, technique such as pars and window or histogram that we didn't talk about in this course is that in GMMs because of having these hyperparameters such as mean and variance and covariance this is a parametric um, method because we are we are bound with the par parameters of the distribution whereas in histogram or pars and window or other techniques uh, they are non-parametric right it has some good advantages and perhaps a little bit of caveats, but in general, GMMs are powerful density estimators, right? 
Again, just like the one-dimensional way, we use this normalizing constant to, to make sure the integral or the area that P on the lines represents, right, becomes zero. All right. You might have heard uh, me talking about IID a few times in this course, so I thought let's just recap it with the slide. So IID stands for identically distributed and independent, right? It's sort of a definition for a, for a data set D that we were mostly um, using it in this course. It's gonna make, it. this assumption makes the math for many machine learning models uh, a little bit easier because we, we can have two assumptions by, by assuming a, a distribution is coming from IID, and that is, if it's coming from IID, right? If and only if we have a function f that maps the data, right? For every x in R, can be if and only if these two are could be equal. So if you have f of x of x, it's going to be equal to f of y of x. Or and the other part, so that was the first part for the identically distributed. For the part that is independent is if and only if f of x of y of x of y, we can expand it to f of x dot f of y of x for every x and y in R. So with these two assumptions, we can assume that the data is coming, the data d is coming from an IID uh, distribution. So uh, that shows that, as a definition, the, the assumption implies that it's coming from a normal distribution. And also it has a finite variance, right? It makes so many other computations in machine learning uh, restricted and easier. All right, so let's talk about Gaussian models. So remember that we are in unsupervised learning methods, so we don't know the label of the data, right? We have a bunch of, bunch of data here in 1D, let's say. So for here and two there, okay? Using a Gaussian mixture model, we are trying to understand their density function, their underlying, that the data could represent width. And we, we assume that those density are coming from a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution. So if we were to find that distribution, we would have some bump, higher bumps here, and a lower one here, right? That would be their estimation, right? So in clustering using mixture model, we still don't know the, the source of the labels, right? We just have some data, that was the x. We can calculate the parameters of the Gaussians instead, right? So instead we can calculate their mean and variance or covariance, okay? Thus we can estimate whether or not a point is more likely to be in either of those clusters. So if a point was coming here, we can understand that this can be considered this cluster or the other one, right? Now. Can you notice the difference between GMMs and K-means right now? So we have to build GMMs based off of the results for K-means? Um, in a way, uh, G GMMs are extension, are an extension of K-means, right? Yeah. But there is a, a, a more intuitive difference. So. What was the parameter in K-mean we were trying to uh, build the algorithm upon? How did we compute the, the centroids? Remember? Remember those moves of the centroids, right, in K-mean? How did we come up with, with centroids in K-mean, given some random cluster, clusters? 
Anything? Do we just move it? Like every iteration, we just move it like, based on like trying to minimize the spread error between it and. So how 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 did we find the 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 minimization answer? So you would compute all the points within its cluster. Okay. Okay. Uh, so in its domain, and then you would just calculate the distances. Distances, right? Yeah. So that was the Euclidean distance, right? So. So you, you can see that easily came in in sort of an J, J, GMMs are, are a you know, uh, broader algorithm because not only it, it, it uses that Euclidean distance, but it has a, a, a hyperparameter of the distribution of the data, which are mean variance or mean and covariance, right? So that's why these are the parameters that you can uh, construct your density uh, function based on, okay? Now you can see the difference between k-min and GMMs. In GMMs, when you want to try to construct this cluster of a density, you take into account you take into account so you have two clusters, right? You take into account the the mean and the variance of the distribution and map it using a Gaussian distribution. But in k-means, whatever you were just trying to focus on was the centroid and the, the, the distance between the each point and the centroid, right? Okay, so that was the only thing that you, you could care of. So that's why G GMMs are a broader, sort of more accurate type of clustering methods because it, it, it accounts for the density of the data using uh, mean and variance. So, are you, are you, what you're trying to say that like a, further, a point that's further away from the center of it, it's not really captured in the k-means so that it's like a lower, like in, in the GMM, it would, have like a, it would be like kind of an edge case for that. Yeah. That cluster of events, yeah. Right? That's not like in K-means, the only thing that uh, uh, you would you would you know uh, care about was the distance between that point and the centroid, right? right? Yeah. But here we, we care about the, the distribution oh, as yeah, a whole, yeah. right? Yeah. As a variance of the distribution, oh, mean of the distribution. Yeah. 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 So K-means is sort of a special case, a simplified case of GMMs where we don't care about the the variance or covariance and, and the, the mean of the distribution, right? Everyone got the idea uh, why we are using GMMs, right? We are trying to fit a normal distribution out of the data that we have, okay? Using the data we have, we can compute easily their mean and covariance or mean and variance, and we can fit it using a normal distribution, okay? So for this simple example, what you need to do for these two clusters is just you have to fit two Gaussian distributions, one for each, right, using their own respective mean and variance. So this one has its own mean, so move one, sigma one, and it has mu two, sigma two, right? All right. So let's see how we're gonna um, how we're gonna sort of train uh, a GMM. So in GMM, we need to account for a weight WJ with a Gaussian kernel, okay, and a sum of Gaussian bumps. So by that bump, I'm talking about that bell shape that you saw in one D, in two D, and three D in earlier slides. Okay, so we have a data set D, just like before. It is it, it is coming from some unlabeled data X's. All of them are vector data uh, from the dimensional space of R, and those X's are coming from an IID distribution. So we can compute their P of X using a mixture of Gaussians or a GMM model. Okay. So the blue the blue represents our data, right? We have more data here around the center some on the left side and some on the right side. So for each of those, we can fit a bell-shaped function, a Gaussian bump, right, function here. It has its own n mu1 uh, variance sigma1. It has mu2 sigma2 and mu3 sigma3, right? 
So the final would be this sort of density estimation of the data. Okay? It's in one dimensional way. Does that make sense? So we have more distribution of data here. That's why their bell shape or the Gaussian bump here is sort of higher because it has its own variance and move here around the center. We have fewer number of data on the left and right side, so they're sort of smaller. Um, so is each of the Gaussian distributions for specifically at local cluster angle? Yeah, yeah. So the area under each one of those would be one? Would it be the probability? The, the overall. The overall? Of the yeah, the level. overall would be one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good question. To say this one is like, I don't know, 60, these are like 20, 20, yeah. right. Okay, so in order to compute that scalar value, that P, the probability of X, right, we need to do a summation of all the J's from 1 to K, and K is 3 here, right, we need to find WJs of their respective normal distribution. In this case, we have three, right? So it has their own J1, 2, 3. So mu1, mu2, and mu3, and then so either covariance or variance, okay? Obviously, our Ws must be greater than zero, otherwise there are no bumps, there are no functions, right? It's gonna be a flat. And then the, the summation of all the ways would be one. All right, so let's have another recap. Um, by the laws of probability, the unconditional probability of X can be computed, right, as, so if you have a normal distribution, we can define it with, with its own hyperparameter mu and covariance. So the PX of that is gonna be the summation of J's from one up to K, which are the number of clusters. So the the, the probability of X given J, right? The, so we, we call this the membership probability as well. So if X is a member of cluster J, right? Or bump membership, sometimes they call it. We should multiply that to the, to the probability of J and it's equal to the one that we just saw in a previous slide. WJs multiply the, the P that is coming from a normal distribution having these two hyperparameter, okay? All right, so now given D, a data set D which is unlabeled, the answer is how we're gonna find, we need to find um, a model, a, dens a density function using WJ, MuJ, and covariance, right? For all the Js from one up to K. And this is, this is considered our model parameter. We call it omega, okay? So we need to find it in a way that maximizes the, the joint probability of all the x's from 1 to n. And you can find it 
as the, the, the product of the all those probabilities. It's a joint probability, right? From n up to n, all those data points in D, you need to do a product of all those p's, okay? Of course, for any optimization problem, we normally want to minimize it. So let's turn it around and define it as the, the in-sample error, just like uh, what we defined the rest of the, the models, right? So the, so the error involved with finding the best uh, estimate of density for given a, uh, for given a data is going to be equal to a minimization of E of N of the omega, right, which represents the, our model parameter. And this one, if you turn it back to a minimization, you're going to have minus log, okay? The summation of minus log of the all those probabilities, right, the bump mem membership given WJs and a normal distribution. So this is considered a point-wise error, right, for all of those data points, and you have to sum it up from n, from 1 up to n, which represents the, the, the value in your D. Okay. You have n points in your D. Of course, our weights should be positive. The summation of all the weights should be 1, and the covariance of J should be also positive as well. Otherwise, this would be, um, this doesn't make sense to just you know, compute anything. Is it clear? So now we've got another minimization problem. Now, how are we going to minimize in sample error of omega? So how are we going to how are we going to update and fine tune these model parameters to come up with the with the lowest error possible when we define when we cluster those data in an unsupervised manner, right? Again, you might just think about SGD. This is what we've been doing uh, in the past for neural net. The issue with SGD, a stochastic gradient descent here, is this E of n now is a complex function. You see here, this is a complex function. And sometimes it does not have second, first or second uh, the derivative of the likelihood function, right? So we're going to end up in some issues. Because in general, SGD works in a constraint, as a constraint optimization. So this is optimization, actually. So what we use instead is the EM algorithm, the expectation maximization. It's an extension of k-mean, just like what we talked about in some slides ago. So it's, again, another iterative method to come up with the uh, locally optimal clusters using a density optimization. Okay, And it's, and it's been proven that it's, it's going to go faster than, than SGD, uh, and it's more generalized, right? Because we, we don't have to take care of the, the, the first and second order uh, derivation of the likelihood function. Okay, So let's see how we're going to find the sub-problems of the EM algorithm now. Just like k-means, <clears throat> now we have to find the first sub-problem. Okay? We have a bunch of data, d. Suppose for each of those xi's in D, we, want, we have to find the Gaussian distribution it belongs to, right? How are we going to find a membership for x in a Gaussian distribution that can be represented using this data, okay? So let us define a B of j as a subset of D that denotes the set of points samples sampled from pj, okay? So the task is we have to estimate wj of that cluster, mu j, covariance, 
for all so and and, and if, if you want to find it for all the clusters we need to do that for all the j's from 1 to k and nj is the absolute value of bj okay so bj is actually uh, when we sample from each of them right by the probability p okay So say, just like what you saw there, for all, for the W's, for W J, since all the W's, the summation of W's should be one. So when we have N J's, we need to divide them by N to make them for each W, right? The mu of J is is going to be simply the summation of all the values of X divided by the number. Okay, all the X N's inside that B J which was a sample mean, right? So we take some samples and that, that's the mean of that sample. And then just like that, we can compute the, the sample covariance, each of those x's minus the, the, the mean, and then we multiply that to the, the transpose version. Okay, again, divided by the number. So this is a sample covariance. So say we have two of them, so we need to compute it for both of them, B1 and B2, okay? And recall this, the summation of this should be 1. That's why we divide it to n. Summation of wj. All right, so, so that was the first top problem. Given some data points, how are we going to find some model parameters, okay? How are we going to estimate W, mu, and covariance, right? So that's the first top problem. Now let's, let's talk about the other way around, so which is our second problem, sub problem. When we have those parameters, when we have those model parameters, how are we going to estimate the bump itself, right? How are we going to estimate the bump membership itself? So we have a bunch of parameters for all the j's from 1 to k, and we want to find the, the, the bump membership. How are we going to find members of x and put it into those specific bumps or functions, right? So for instance, we need to find pj of x that is most likely to produce xn, right? We can define xn to be in bj a star, which is the final bj that we converge to, if j a star has the maximization uh, notion of p of j given xn, okay, for all the j's. How are we going to define this now? How are we going to define a bump membership in a statistics, right? So in order to in order to come up with that conditional probability, let's talk about 
another notion that uh, you might have heard and this is called map rule okay maximum posteriori probability okay this is called map rule or map estimate in 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 Bayes theory uh, it's been used a lot we didn't have time to talk about Bayesian models but uh, I thought you need to know this before carry on with the sub problem number two and that is a map estimate <coughs> Is an estimate of an unknown quantity okay that equals the mode of the posterior distribution posterior distribution in general is a distribution that when you fit some distribution some parameters what's going to be the the outcome of that distribution is it's, it's a posterior distribution right so it, what, what's going to happen after you fit some uh, parameters into a model so it can be used to obtain an estimate of an uh, observed quantity using a Bayes theorem, right? So the probability of J in Xn is going to be the probability of Xn given J, Pj, so that's a class J, and you need to divide it by the, all the classes, the summation of all those classes, right? This is coming from the Bayes theory. And using this map estimate, we can understand how we're going to find the bump membership, right? We have those parameters, how we're going to find their bump membership. We use a map estimate, <clears throat> and that'll give us mapping into our own problem. This P of X given J, PJ, is going to be defined just like what we knew, WJ, and that PJ is coming from a normal distribution, right? And we can define a normal distribution using this own parameter, which was move and covariance, right? And we need to divide this for the class J for all the classes. This is for all classes. So our empirical data are the one we observe, right? Are, are our x's. X ends. All right, let's put these two problems, sub problems together, sub problem one and two. First, how are we gonna find the hyperparameter of the, the density estimation and then so problem two was when we have those parameters, how are we going to maximize that to find the best bump membership? Okay, and that'll give us the first algorithm for EM, which is the hard uh, decision. The clusters do not overlap, just like came in clustering. So first, we need to initialize right with some arbitrary bump membership given x x i's. So you have this amount of data. You arbitrarily chose this and this. Actually, these two do not overlap. This, this, and this. Okay, two arbitrary one, and then on the second one, you need to estimate, given the data that you chose, right, the W's, moves, and covariance for all those two. In this case, we have two Ks, two Ks. Okay. So this would be B1, and this would be B2. And third, we need to estimate the bump membership given this. So now given these hyperparameters, we need to estimate are these included in that or we need to update those, right? Or we need to update those. For instance, do we need to put this one on the B2 and B1 becomes only one point or not? Right? So on the third one, on the third um, step, we need to estimate bomb membership given omega for all the B1s up to BK. All right? And then we're going to repeat the steps two and three until convergence. <coughs> 
Was that clear, the hard decision? So it's, it's, it's pretty close to k-means, but instead of just using the centroid, we are feeding the data in uh, a distribution that was coming from a normal distribution, right? We assume that the data could be fitted using a normal distribution, and the normal distribution can be represented by what? A mean and covariance parameter. So we need to find those. When we find those, when, when we start with arbitrary one, we find those that we put inside this each distribution. We can find mu1, covariance1, mu2, covariance2. And then we use map rule to update the memberships for each of those. Do we need to put one data in another one or vice versa? Okay. All right. So that was the hard decision of EM algorithm. Let's let's talk about the soft decision. We need to have a little tweak on the the way we establish the the memberships so that the uh, the clusters can indeed overlap. And that was the the main difference between hard and soft uh, EM. So in order to do that, we need to find a parameter to define this, right? Define uh, what was the value of your data D that was overlapped between two clusters, right? And we need to define this as each iterations. So we need to find a, a parameter that explains what amount of data was overlapped combined between two clusters at iteration T, for instance, and at which clusters, right? So for that, we define this parameter that explains what fraction of x belongs to what j, what cluster, at what iteration. So we need to take into account these three together, right? In order to uh, monitor the, the overlapping, you know, sort of property that we are allowing the EM to have, okay? Okay, so let's define this new sort of parameter. We are allowing at each step a fraction of x's, right, belonging to multiple beads, right? We denote that by a small omega, right, omega n and j at time t, right? So with this parameter, we can sort of keep keep note of the x's that are overlapping or belonging to multiple clusters, which are clusters in j, and at time t, right? Time first, second, time 10. So we can keep track of this. All right, <clears throat> if this one was positive, of course should be positive, and a summation of those must be one, if the summation is not one, what does that mean? Can anyone suggest any debugging? If the summation of the fractions of data that are belonging to multiple uh, j's at iteration t was more than one, 
It could be, but it still should be one in that case. It's, it's still one, one sort of overlapping, right? They can completely overlap. But if this one is above one, that shows that you, you, you have counted a data twice, at least. Right? Because the summation of all fractions it still should be one. Yeah? Does that make sense? Okay. So these two conditions should hold. The summation of all the fractions at time t should be 1. And the fraction value itself, the, 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 the small omega at time t should be positive. Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense to have a soft you know, decision. Hard would have been enough for you. And this n is for all the data, data points from 1 up to n, right? And then we need to update the omega given this at each iteration t, right? At each t, we need to update this now. There is another extra parameter. Uh, there is another extra parameter that uh, <laughs> that we need to take into account any time we want to compute the the omega. Yeah. All right. So that was sort of the the major tweak between hard and soft. So let's see what else we need to take into account now after we define this new parameter. Just like before, just like what Hart did, we need to estimate the parameters. Now instead of computing NJs without the T, now T matters because at each point we need to uh, sort of keep trace or keep track of all those fractions, right? So NJ of T corresponds to the summation of all the Ns from 1 to N of the uh, lambda nj of, of t. The wt now, instead of being flat as this, now we need to take into account the t as well, because at each, so that was a hard one. Now in sof, we need to take into account each of those, those t's. And the effective number of points associated with BJ. Okay. All right. So we need to compute the parameters. The parameters were mean and covariance. The mean can be estimated as, again, now instead of xn itself, we need to find the fraction. We need to take into account the fraction of those data that are overlapping as well. So lambda nj of t multiply xn and then sum, we sum them up for all the data and divide it by n to find their main, mean. And for covariance, we need to just find each of those uh, data minus their mean and divide it by their, the, the, the same subtraction transpose, multiply it by the fraction, and divide it by n. So that's the, the mean and that's the covariance. So e easily we can just define our w, mean, and covariance again. Yeah? And then finally, after we found the, the estimating parameters, what we need to do is just we need to use the map rule again using the, the, the base theorem, right? So we need to update the fraction given uh, omega, the parameters. So the fraction of n of j now in the next iteration, which is going to be the t plus 1, is going to be the, the probability of having that data inside class j or cluster J, right? We need to update that. Whether or not a data belongs to that cluster or do we need to swap them? So we can define it as the, pro the, the joint probability of Xn given cluster J and the probability of the cluster itself and the overall 
clusters, which represents all the data, right? This would be equal to computing the, the normal distribution that that fraction represents at time t divided by all those data. So the only thing that changed from a hard decision to soft was the definition of the fraction, right? The, the, lum, uh, the small lambda at n and cluster j at time t, okay? So put them all together in a pseudocode, you're going to have the soft version of EM. Just like before, we're going to initialize it randomly. We define some bumps for some uh, data. Then given those data, we're going to update the fraction of data that are belonging to perhaps multiple clusters. And we find those model parameters by this omega. I'm talking about finding the WJ at time t finding the mu j at time t and finding the covariance right given the fraction that we had then using map again posteriori information right and base theorem we're going to find their bump membership so are we going to exchange some clusters uh, data within the clusters or not and we're going we're gonna to repeat two and three again until convergence you see that just like k means we need to have sort of a rough idea of the number of k right the number of clusters it just doesn't find the clusters automatically there are other techniques like uh, siluhe um, performance evaluation that you can sort of come up with a k but in general gmms just like k means you have to have an input of k for the model all right so let's just have a quick um, example of how soft clustering will converge. So this is coming from a, a data that was, so you see there are no labels, but they have been trying to come up with two metrics, two representative metrics to characterize their space of D, right? These are the D data. So all of the X points, X ends in D, okay? So they have been sort of using two features, X1 and X2, and X1 was red blood cell volume, so that was the volume of the red blood, and the X, X2 was red blood concentration, okay? So for, by concentration and volume, using an unsupervised learning, no labels, so we are defining this sort of data, okay? So what do you think, and assuming we have two clusters, what do you think the final clusters would be in, in, in a soft decision? Here? So like something like here and then here? Okay, let's see. So we start <clears throat> at first iteration, right? EM iteration one. So two random clusters, and these are the outliers, right? And this is randomly started. So we compute the, the model parameters, mu, w's, and the covariance, right? And then two iterations later on, you see that the, the red cluster, let's call it B2, is going to start expanding to add this data as well into itself. Okay? This data. Iteration 5, you see, is getting expanded, expanded. And then the, on the other side, the B, B1, let's call it B1, the green one, and this is B2, right? It's, it's, it's getting leaned towards this data that your colleague mentioned that it makes sense to have them as one cluster because their their characteristics their mean and covariance sort of look similar right to have them one in one cluster iteration 10 you see that this is exactly going in in the way we thought right they're getting further and further iteration 15 there is only a very small overlap and red uh, and b1 almost found its final step after 10 more iterations, you see there are no more differences, mostly, 
And that's why we understand that perhaps the algorithm converges and it's, it has been saturated, right? Because perhaps we run it for 100 more iterations, we don't see much of uh, a sensible differences, right? The other way to understand that when you plot it using the number of iterations and their log likelihood, you see that the after 15 up to the rest, we don't, we don't see much of the difference in our probability here, right? So it's almost as if it was saturated up to this point. And that was this, the stopping point for us, okay? All right, so that was the, a quick recap of uh, EM algorithm, both soft and hard. Next lecture, we're going to talk about pack learning and some theoretical stuff. And then next week, we're going to wrap up the course with bias variance and perhaps cross-validation and, uh, yeah. All right. Um, are there any questions? Cool. See you on Wednesday.